Good evening, church, and uh, good morning to you, John. What an honor it is for me this evening to introduce you, church, to Dr. John Oakes. John was born and raised in Connecticut on the East Coast of the United States, very close to where I was born and raised. He earned a Bachelor of Science degree in chemistry at the University of Connecticut. John became a Christian as a graduate student in 1978 as part of the campus ministry in Boulder, Colorado. And it was in 1984 that John earned his PhD and became a doctor in chemical physics from the University of Colorado. He and Jan were married the same year. They moved to Spokane, Washington, where John was a chemistry professor at Gonzaga University. From there, they moved to San Diego, where they worked in the ministry from 1986 to 1988. And then John returned to teaching at the University of California, San Diego, and other colleges in the area. In 1993, John and his wife and three children moved to Wisconsin, where he had a position as professor of chemistry and physics at Marion College. In 2000, their family returned to San Diego, where John worked as a professor of chemistry at Grossmont College until he retired in 2018. But, but church, we know there's no such thing as retiring in the kingdom of God. <laughs> no such thing. And John and his wife, Jan, were called to lead the church in Bakersfield, California. So they moved to Bakersfield and they lead the church there. John is also a gifted author of over 14 books and he has published a number of CDs. John's interest in Christian uh, evidences sprang naturally from him being a scientist and having a dual PhD in chemistry and phys physics and having taught for over 30 years has made him uniquely qualified to deal with the areas of science and the Bible. Besides science, John is very interested in church history and history in general. He is also interested in philosophy and studies in the Christian worldview. He's taught a number of classes on Christian world, worldview, Christian theology, and related topics. John has taught adults, campus, singles, and teens for more than 190 churches in more than 80 countries and at 60 universities. We are so fortunate to have John teach us for the next six weeks. Thank you, John, in advance for teaching us, and thank you for your lifelong commitment to God's kingdom. Before we start, please join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father God, what a blessing it is to have John teach our church. Help us to listen intently with open hearts and open minds, and help these sessions help us grow as Christians and disciples so we can become more like Jesus Christ. Please keep all of our church and our kingdom safe as we continue to battle the, the COVID pandemic, and we especially want to pray for those brothers and sisters who have lost family members and friends to this dreaded disease. In closing, uh, Lord, please give John an extra dose of your Holy Spirit and godly wisdom as he teaches us tonight and for five weeks thereafter. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Uh, good seeing everybody. It's been about seven years, I think, since I was there in Dubai. Uh, moving to Bakersfield helps me to relate a little bit better to you guys, because in San Diego, it's about 28 degrees this time of year, but in, in Bakersfield, it's about 42. And uh, so there's a reason they call it Bakersfield, because we bake here in Bakersfield. Anyway, um, I'm really glad I get to teach this class. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, I've, been, I've taught Revelation a few times, and I, I think uh, especially Revelation is a helpful book in troubled times when things are seem to be sometimes maybe out of control in a sense. And of course, that does relate to the things going on with COVID and other things in our world. All right, um, so uh, just a few sources here. Uh, probably some of you are aware that Gordon Ferguson wrote a book on Revelation. Tied, titled Revelation Revealed. My favorite book on the book of Revelation is the one by Jim McWiggin. Uh, you can get a copy of his book uh, online. He's a Church of Christ guy. A few other books that I've read on the topic. So let, I, I'm going to spend a fair amount of time in introductory material. I would say probably the book of Revelation needs more 
sort of introductory material to prepare you to read the book than any other book in the New Testament, maybe than any book in the Bible, because it's, it is quite unique. So uh, the book is titled Revelation. In fact, the word revelation comes directly from Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, because the word apocalypsis uh, is right there in the, in the first verse, which means uh, basically unveiling. So I want to talk about apocalyptic literature. It's a particular kind of literature that's found both in the Old Testament, the New Testament, and also in Jewish literature between the Testaments. So um, the purpose of apocalyptic literature is to show in dramatic fashion that God is in control. So when we're, when we're looking at apocalyptic literature, the question of who is in control of what's going on in the world is coming up. And I, again, I already said, I think this seems particularly relevant in the last couple of years. Another uh, purpose of apocalyptic literature, besides showing that God's in control, is to explain and make it understandable what the kingdom of God is. So to a very significant extent, the book of Revelation is a revelation of the kingdom of God. The purpose of apocalyptic writings is to stress the virtue of loyalty, to stimulate faith, by showing in vivid fashion the, uh, the, the overthrow of evil and the final victory for God's righteous cause. Okay, I forgot to start my tape, okay? So I think I just started it now. Great. All right, so the purpose then is to show that God's in control. Some characteristics of apocalyptic literature. Uh, one, one thing about apocalyptic literature is it tends to be produced during troubled times. In other words, there's going to be a historical context, historical background, whenever God reveals something through apocalyptic literature. It would be a time when God's people are going through struggles or difficulties. So, for example, there's apocalyptic literature in Isaiah, and that's during the time of the destruction of the northern kingdom. There's apocalyptic literature in Ezekiel and Daniel. That's during the time of the destruction of the southern kingdom. And um, a revelation, of course, the time of the extreme persecution that began under Domitian. Uh, another characteristic of apocalyptic literature, it's very cryptic. Uh, cryptic, that means like a puzzle, hidden. And so um, generally, apocalyptic literature, you, you need a little bit of help to understand it. You need some background, which is why, like I said, I'm going to spend more time in introductory material on this book than any other book I would teach. And why, why does God use sort of a hidden, remember, apocalypse means re revelation or unveiling. And uh, one, one possible way of thinking about it is uh, because generally apocalyptic literature is revealing things that God's enemies are not going to be too happy about. All right. The nation is under great duress. And really, the message of Revelation is that God is going to destroy the Roman power. So you can see why, if God is going to reveal a message about that to the Jewish people, why he might want to reveal it in a way that it wouldn't be so obvious to the enemies of God. And it kind of makes sense. Another distinction I want to make is the distinction between prophecy and apocalyptic literature. Now, often you'll find apocalyptic writing in a generally prophetic book. For example, in Ezekiel, there's a fair amount of apocalyptic literature in the book of Ezekiel, quite a bit actually. There's also some in the book of Isaiah. All right, so uh, prophecy is mainly preaching and only secondarily prediction. So prophecy primarily is, thus says the Lord. Here's God's direct communication to you in words that are not hard to figure out. Apocalyptic is exactly the opposite. Apocalyptic is mainly prediction and only secondarily preaching. And of course, that certainly applies in the book of Revelation. We have two chapters of what would be normal prophecy, thus says the Lord, chapter 2 and 3. And then uh, um, 20 chapters of, of vision. 
Apocalyptic literature generally is a broader scope. So prophecy generally is about a very specific situation and it applies to that specific situation. Whereas uh, apocalyptic literature generally has a worldwide focus. Another thing about apocalyptic literature is it, it contains a lot of, sorry for this big fancy word, eschatology. Is that on the screen yet? Eschatology. All right, uh, you know, I don't like to use too many big words. I admit that's kind of a big word. Eschatology means the study of end times. All right, and so almost all apocalyptic literature at least has a partial view to what's going to happen at the end of time. And that's certainly true with Revelation. Uh, the last two chapters, a little bit more than two chapters, deal with the end of time. Similar with Daniel. Daniel 12 has to do with the end of time. Another factor to bear in mind when you're understanding apocalyptic literature, such as Daniel, Ezekiel, Zechariah, is there's a historical setting, and that historical setting is significant. So the historical setting, of course, as I'm guessing most likely that you know already, is the persecution of the church in the first, second, and third century, specifically under Domitian. And the purpose then is to give comfort to God's people who are undergoing a very difficult situation. So what you want to do is, in interpreting apocalyptic literature, you want to first ask yourself, what that I'm reading here would be the message to the original audience, and then ask, right, well then how does it apply, you know, in, in the current situation? All right, so the setting of Daniel would be um, the persecution of the Jews under Antiochus Epiphanes, et cetera. All right, uh, another thing about prophecy is it, there's many visions. So there'll, there'll be visions in prophetic literature, but there's many, many visions in, in uh, apocalyptic literature. Another thing really important, obviously, is the symbolism. Again, in most of the Bible, we assume that what you're reading is literal, unless there's reason to think it might be actually symbolic. But in apocalyptic literature, it's the exact opposite. Everything you're reading, you assume is symbolic, unless there's a reason in the context to take it literally. All right. So um, th this is then uh, there's certain symbols that are kind of stock symbols, uh, and and so uh, most of the symbolism found in the Book of Revelation is found somewhere else. And we're going to see this. As we're going through the book, we're going to say, this is just like what you see there in Ezekiel. This is like what you see in Daniel 7 or in Daniel 9, This is etc. All right. And so, for example, the use of numbers has a sort of a stock meaning. It's not explained. It's assumed. And you can assume that at least for sure the Jews, the Jewish Christians who received the book of Revelation, they knew exactly what these numbers meant. They knew what these colors meant. So let me just spend a little bit of time talking about uh, the, the sort of standard meaning of, of numbers and colors. Okay, uh, so when there's one of something, that is talking about unity or uniqueness. When there's two of something, that's talking about strength or energy, two are better than one. So we'll see two witnesses in Revelation uh, at the time of the, of the uh, um, temple being measured. Are there literally two witnesses? Are we supposed to look for two people in history? No, no, no. The fact that there's two witnesses means those witnesses have strength or power. So two of something is symbolic of strength. Uh, three. Three is the divine number. It's the number of God. All right, the, 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 the idea of Trinity. Four. If you see four of something, that's a reference to something in relationship to the world. The four winds, the four directions, the four angels, the four creatures. If it says there are four creatures, does that mean there's exactly four, literally four creatures? We talk about the um, the cherubim. I mean, uh, maybe you know, maybe maybe that is how many cherubim that John saw. But that's not the point. The point is the cherubim are going throughout the world. The four divisions of the wild animals, the four horsemen, the four uh, there's. Four comes up again. Four has to do with things related to the to the world, to the physical world. Uh, the number six, 
you're probably aware of that. The number six, when there's six of something, uh, by the way, seven is the number of perfection. Six is one short of perfection. And anything short of perfection is of the world. So the number six, obviously you're aware of six, six, six. We'll get to that. So six is the number of Satan, the number of doom, the number of sinister and sinful things. Seven represents perfection. Seven spirits, seven churches. By the way, remember I said, generally you take things symbolically unless the context says to take it literally. So there are seven churches in Asia, and there are literally seven churches. And it's literally addressed to seven churches. And yet the fact that God chooses seven carries symbolism with it as well. So in that case, the number of seven is both literal and symbolic. Seven stars, seven sections of Revelation, uh, seven signs, seven I am statements in the book of John, seven miracles in the book of John. So this is the number that represents perfection or God. Another interesting number is the number three and a half. Three and a half represents a, a limited period of time. If something happens for three and a half years, that doesn't mean three and a half years. It means uh, it, a set period of time. It could be 50 years. It could be three weeks. It could be whatever. Sometimes you'll see 42 months. 42 months is three and a half years. So if something la happens for 42 months, that means not literally 42 months. Could be. Probably not, though. It means a limited period of time. Also, 1260 days, which is 42 times 30. Uh, also, you'll see time, times, and half a time. One, two, and a half, three and a half. So there are a number of cases, including in Revelation, where you'll see the number three and a half. Daniel 7, 25, Revelation 11, 2, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, the next number we want to talk about is 10. 10 represents complete or full, all right? And so, uh, it, and so um, 10 fingers, I think that's probably where the idea of 10 came from. The dragon has 10 horns, which means it's got a full amount of power. Does the, does the dragon literally have 10 horns? Well, again, maybe John saw literally 10 horns in the vision. Maybe he didn't. It, it's, either way, it does, it's not the point. Uh, and then there's multiples of 10. So if seven means perfection, then 70 means complete perfection. And a thousand represents 10 times 10 times 10, which means, which means essentially completely complete, if you will. All right, the number 12, the number 12 is the number of God's people. And you see that again, uh, it, you'll, there'll be 12 tribes in revelation i believe it's 13. um again if it says there's 12 don't take that literally 12 apostles that's literal 12 tribes that's literal but in apocalyptic literature if you have 12 of something that means this is something to do with god's people then of course famously there's 144,000. right please do not do what the jehovah witness do and take that literally all right, because 144,000 is 12 times 12 times 10 times 10 times 10, which is God's people, all of them, all God's people. That's what 144,000 means. Got it? Another thing is colors. I'm not going to focus on color very much. On Zechariah, God uses color symbolically often. In Revelation, he does as well. I don't, I don't learn a lot from this, honestly, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. A red represents war or sacrifice. White represents purity. Purple represents royalty. Blue represents heaven. Pale yellow means near death. Crimson represents blood. Uh, gold represents divinity, etc. These things, it's on the screen. By the way, um, if you go to my website, evidenceforchristianity.org, I'm skipping a lot of the introductory material because if I did all my introductory material, we wouldn't even get into chapter one today. <laughs> I want to get into chapter one today. So if you go to my website, evidenceforchristianity.org, I'm going to publish my PowerPoint. I'm going to publish my notes, about 60 pages worth of notes. Uh, hopefully, I'll also put the audio there, although I see this is being recorded. 
All right, the next thing, and I'm almost done with my list of uh, characteristics of apocalyptic literature, and this is the most important characteristic of apocalyptic literature, which is that it's dramatic. Really, it's the chief thing about apocalyptic literature as that it's very dramatic. It uses grotesque and terrifying images, and the reason is to catch our attention. It's kind of like a comic book. All right, it's it's sort of like a religious comic book with pictures. Rivers of blood, hail, locusts, dragons, death, riding a horse with a grave following behind, animals with many heads, a dragon, a beast, a false prophet which vomits a frog, and locusts. And these are exaggerated symbols, and it's intended to get your attention. All right, so take it for what it is. All right, uh, th this is a, screen, a, a slide about uh, um, apocalyptic literature between the Testaments. I'm not going to get into that. Old Testament apocalyptic passages. I'm going to skip that. All right, so summary. There's going to be a definite historical setting. The imagery, we got to get the big picture. Do not get caught up in the details like so many premillennialists do. And the Daniel 2, there's the statue with the two legs. And what's the meaning of the two legs? And what about the ten toes and all that kind of stuff? Get the big picture. Try to uh, not look at the trees, see the forest. So after we look at the definite historical setting, after we allow the imagery to set up the big picture, then we can apply the apocalyptic passages to our current situation in our world today. Okay, makes sense. All right. Now, I don't have a lot of time to spend on the whole end time views and all that kind of stuff. Uh, we could spend an hour on this. I, I just want to make you just sort of generally aware because the bottom line is Revelation is, is misused a lot. <laughs> In fact, I believe Revelation is far more misused than used in the Christian context. I'm guessing you're not unaware of that. So I want to spend just a few minutes describing the different end time views, end time interpretations from Revelation. I'll, I'll talk about uh, some of the problems with some of those and then what I believe is the most reasonable end time view to take with the book of Revelation. All right, so there's a number of views and you don't need to know the fancy words for these, but I think you might want to be aware of these words because you're going to be having discussions with people if you're around evangelical believers, which I believe there's a good number of those there in, in um, uh, the, the Gulf region. All right, so one view is the preterist. That, that's pre. So the preterist view is that all or nearly all the visions, the prophecies in the book of Revelation involve things that have already happened. All right, that is the majority view of uh, the Churches of Christ, uh, but it's not the only view. It's, all right, the next is the amillennialist view. The amillennialist view basically says that the thousand years of Revelation 20, there is no literal thousand years at all. Because remember, 10 times 10 times 10, a uh, thousand would mean they're complete until this, this time is complete. So the amillennialist says Jesus will not be ruling on the earth and there will be no literal thousand year reign because the prefix a means not atheist, not God. So preterist, basically these, these revelations, these pictures involve something that has already happened. Amillennialism says there is no actual physical thousand year reign. Premillennialism, which is by far the, the most common view certainly amongst uh, Protestant and evangelical believers. And it's the idea that Jesus is going to come back, all right, but before the millennium, essentially, okay? Um, and, and, and so that's the thousand-year reign of Christ on the earth, and then the end of time comes. Okay, I'll talk a little bit more about that and why that's a problem. So Jesus comes back before the millennium, and then there's post-millennialism. There are not a lot of post-millennials around today. 
During the 19th century and late 18th century, uh, most Christians were post-millennialists. You might have heard of Alexander Campbell, who essentially started the Stone Campbell movement, of which we're part. And he, his journal was called the Millennial Harbinger. And the post-millennialist says there's going to be a period of a thousand years where Christianity sort of rules the world, and then Christ comes back. All right? So pre-millennialist, Christ comes back, then the thousand-year reign. Uh, the post-millennialist, a thousand-year reign of Christianity, then Jesus comes back. All right, good. Philosophy of history, I'm not going to get into that one. All right. Uh, so basically then, Revelation is either principally about, uh, entirely about the time of the Roman persecution, or it's about the, the apostasy of Rome, it's about the future, it's about end times, or possibly it's really just a picture about how God deals with mankind in general. All right, now, I, I'm going to tell you that my view is a combination of number one and number five on the screen there. In other words, um, I believe primarily the preterist view is the correct one. I'm going to explain why. I'm going to use Revelation itself to explain why. It certainly seems to be the case. All right, but also I believe not only is Revelation primarily about events that happened in the first, second, and third century, but also that it has a general application, number five on the list here, in how God deals with mankind in all times. Got it? All right. Now let's talk a little bit about premillennialism. Uh, there's all these movies and books and, and Christian radio, Christian TV. They're all caught up in all this stuff about, you know, Ezekiel and Daniel and what's in off in the Middle East comes in. The political events in the Middle East are called in here. All right. It's, it's the idea. I'm going to skip all this stuff here. Oh, that's a bunch of stuff we want to do. Futurist. Blah, blah. All right. Here's the picture of the premillennial view. So the premillennial view is this that there will be a rapture and then a, a period of seven years of great uh, upheaval. And then Christ comes back. He reigns in Jerusalem in a rebuilt temple there physically in Jerusalem for a thousand years. And then God rolls, the, rolls up the, the screen and then the end of times comes. So there's the seven years. And that silly picture, that's a real picture of pe things people actually believe. See the millennial age and the rapture and all this kind of stuff. Now, I mean, is, the, is belief in premillennialism harmful? To me, it's only harmful if it distracts people from uh, really uh, living the Christian life. In other words, it becomes kind of an excuse to get all excited about stuff that really has nothing to do with anything. <laughs> I mean, does it really matter? All right. If you say it doesn't really matter, then I suppose you could say that believing in premillennialism doesn't really matter that much, other than just being wrong, which I'd rather be right than wrong, I guess. All right. But there are a few problems with premillennialism. I, I want to explain why I think probably we want to discourage this view, even though it's not a it's not a salvation issue. Okay. Uh, first of all. Um, it, it, it makes the book of Revelation, oh, by the way, it contradicts Revelation 1, 1 through 3, which means it's probably wrong. But another thing is, it means the book of Revelation has almost no relevance to the people it was written to. In other words, clearly the book of Revelation is presented as a message to the seven churches in Asia. And if the premillennial view is true, then the book of Revelation has virtually nothing, virtually nothing to do with the audience. It doesn't make any sense. Another problem with premillennialism, it involves blatantly over-literalizing things, which are clearly to be taken symbolically. Uh, another problem with um, the premillennial view is it confuses the Old and the New Testament. And, that's very common in evangelical Christianity to, to, to believe that things like the, the, the Ten Commandments are still in application today. That relates to Calvinism. I'm going to go into all that. 
but it has Jesus reestablishing sacrifice at a temple in Jerusalem, which makes no sense from the point of view of salvation in the New Testament. But if there is any problem with premillennial view, the main problem is it has errors related to the kingdom of God. Because according to the premillennial view, the kingdom of God has not yet been established. The kingdom of God lies in the future. But Jesus and John said, behold, the kingdom of God is at hand. And when Jesus came, he, he was coming in the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God came in some ways in, in Acts 2, but it came when Jesus was on the earth. So there's significant issues in understanding the kingdom if you accept the premillennial view. Now, I spent five minutes on that. I probably spent too much time. I probably spent too much time. All right, so a little bit of historical background to the book of Revelation. Uh, the, the, John says in Revelation 1, 9, I, John, your brother and companion in suffering kingdom and in patient endurance that are ours in Jesus was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. So what this does is it probably places the book of Revelation during the very early phase of the, of the persecution under Emperor Domitian. All right. There were a number of persecutions of the church. You can see on the screen the, the small persecution under Nero in 64 AD, the persecution under Domitian in 95 and 96. That's probably the immediate context of the book of Revelation. That's when John was sent into exile on the island of Patmos. I'll show you a map so you'll see where that is. But then there were a number of other persecutions. You, you, uh, a lot of Christians believe the persecution of the church in the first century was very intense. And, and it was compared to the persecutions that we have today. But the, the most intense persecutions by far were in the third and fourth century under Decius, Valerian, Diocletian, and Galerian. And so the book of Revelation does not directly apply to those later persecutions in the third and fourth century, but I guarantee you the Christians suffering those extreme persecutions where thousands and thousands were rounded up and killed and executed, I guarantee you they would have seen a lot in the book of Revelation, and the book was for them. It's for us as well, but I think under times of great persecution is when the book of Revelation is particularly relevant. Here's the island of Patmos. I got to go there. We took a boat there from Ephesus. Uh, you get a feeling for where it is. Now, you have to understand that John was the bishop, the, the principal elder in the city of Ephesus, okay? And so when he was sent to Patmos, he's sent to an island, oh, uh, about maybe 80 miles or so, something like that, uh, from uh, Ephesus. And from Ephesus is kind of at the farthest reach, kind of on the edge of civilization, kind of like that, okay? So the date of, of Revelation is probably in the 90s. Here's another picture. In this picture, you can see where Ephesus is and you can see where Patmos is. Okay, there's an actual picture that I took when I was on Patmos from the cave, which is up on the hill. There's the cave that people say is where John wrote the book of Revelation. Whether it's true or not, don't know. Okay, great. So there's the date. There's a slight, slight, slight possibility that the book of Revelation was bit written during the reign of Vespasian. I don't think so. It doesn't matter that much anyway, so I'm just gonna move on, all right? Authorship, I've got several slides on that. Hey, look, the Apostle John. John, who was the, uh, an elder, the head elder in the, in the city of Ephesus, which is almost certainly where John died, okay? I'm not gonna spend any more time on that. Okay, now we're getting to the important part. All right, we're about to start the actual book of Revelation. I want to talk about theme and message, and then we'll actually head into the book. Uh, we only have about 15 minutes in the actual book today. So the theme of Revelation is this. Peel back the layers of history and, and look 
around the terrible persecutions. And what do we find? Revelation chapter 4, Revelation chapter 5. God is on his throne. And the Lamb is right there in the throne room. If you want to understand the book of Revelation, spend some time in Revelation chapter 4 and Revelation chapter 5. That's the opening picture. Everything up to Revelation 3 is introduction. Revelation, the book of Revelation starts in Revelation chapter 4. God is on his throne. And the elders are worshiping God. And the cherubim are protecting the holiness of God. Revelation chapter 5. The lamb is there. And the lamb opens the scrolls. So the message of Revelation is this. Be encouraged and be faithful to Jesus Christ. Jesus is Lord, not Caesar. Not whatever Arab... Uh, whatever rain thing that goes on there in Dubai or Oman or whatever. So Revelation then is a divine picture book, like a spiritual cartoon representing how God relates to things going on in the world. Romans appeals to the mind. Psalms appeals to the heart. Revelation appeals to the imagination. All right, let's get into the book of Revelation, for which we'll only get through chapter one. Here's the outline, chapter one, prologue, introducing the entire background to the book. Then chapter two and three, the letters to the seven churches. We'll finish those next week. And then we have the seven seals, the seven trumpets, the seven mystical figures, the seven vials, the enemies of God. God's seven enemies are overthrown, and then the kingdom of God is revealed. There you go. That, that's it. Okay, people get caught up in uh, the seals, the trumpets, the, the mystical figures and the vials, uh, the bowls, if you will. All right, we'll, we'll spend time there. We'll, we'll kind of guess what's happening there. But again, remember Revelation 4 and 5 and then Revelation 21 and 22. Okay, that's the main picture. All right, so let's get into the prologue. All right, it. it I don't have time for that. That's an interesting slide. I don't have time for that. Okay, good. So Revelation 1.1, 1, 1. let's read it. Actually, no, let's go back to that. Outline. Okay, so this is sort of a quick outline of the Bible. Genesis chapter 1, God created the universe and he created the earth. Everything is good. Genesis chapter 2, God created humanity to have a relationship with him and a relationship with one another, and it was good. Genesis 3, 4, 5, we messed up very badly. We lost our place in the garden. We, we are under control of sin. Revelation 5 through Reve, uh, Genesis 5 through Revelation 20, God is fixing the problem. And then Revelation 21 and 22, God has fixed the problem, and we're back in the garden. So in many ways, Revelation is the perfect completion to what began in Genesis. Genesis, the beginning of the story, Revelation, the, con the completion of the story. So Genesis and Revelation are perfect bookends to the Bible. So that's why that's actually a good thing. To show. Okay, Revelation 1-1. All right. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. Two things must the greek word there is dei must morally necessary but basically what saying is this is showing what must happen according to god's will the persecution of the church must happen and then the judgment on god's persecutions also must happen it's necessary just like Jesus said, it is necessary that I go to Jerusalem. He said that in Matthew 16, 20, right here. What John said, what God says to John is the things we're about to occur are some things that must happen. This is important to the seven churches because they would say, God, why would you send this persecution on us? And God's saying, this is my will. This must happen. 
when. The next word is quickly, right? It, it says uh, what must soon take place. The word is taxeos, quickly. In 2 Timothy 4, 9, he says, come to me quickly. Come to me right away. So this involves things that will soon take place. It's interesting. In Revelation 1, 1, it says this involves things that will soon take place. Then you go to the end of Revelation. And in Revelation 22, 6, it says, again, it must soon take place. So this involves things which are going to happen when? Soon. Now, if I said to you, I'm going to be visiting you there in Dubai soon, how would you interpret that? Would you interpret that as tomorrow, as next year, or as 40 years from now? Probably you would not interpret it as tomorrow because that wouldn't really make sense, but it certainly wouldn't be 40 years from now. So remember we have the preterist view, the post-millennial view, the amillennial view, and the pre-millennial view. Which one seems to be in mind? The answer is the preterist view. Most of the book of Revelation involves things that happened in the immediate context. In other words, the, the recipients of the book of Revelation experienced in their lifetime the things that we're representing and the symbolic things that are going on there in Revelation. Simple. Is that the whole story? No, because almost certainly Revelation 21 and 22 and part of Revelation 20 do involve future. By the way, there are some people that are full preterists. Some people in the churches of Christ believe everything in the book of Revelation has already been completely fulfilled. I don't agree with them. It doesn't matter to me too much. Great. Uh, by the way, not only does it say it's going to uh, uh, happen soon in Revelation 1 and 22, 6, but also Revelation 3. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. So in Revelation 1, 3, it says the time of these things is near. And then guess what? In Revelation 22, 10, it says the time for these things is happening is near. It's near at the beginning, it's near at the end. Soon at the beginning, soon at the end, all right? Now, interestingly, in Daniel 9, 26, it says, this prophecy concerns things of the distant future. In that case, I won't go into the details, but the distant future is roughly 700 years after the prophecy. So if you want to just get into an argument, which I don't want to do, you'd say, well, 700 years is distant future. Therefore, if the things in Revelation were happening now, that would certainly not be soon. Got it? End of story. Preterism is the primary view to take in the book of Revelation. All right. Then he says in verse, uh, oh, I might as well read uh, verse 2. Who testifies to everything he saw. So John saying, I, Christ, blessed is the one who reads these, the, aloud the words of this prophecy. So I'm reading them aloud, okay, folks? We're going to read aloud almost the entire book of Revelation. You know what that means? It means you are blessed. Guess how many blessings there are in the book of Revelation? Ah, the same as the number in, in Matthew, in the uh, Beatitudes. Revelation 1.3. Blessed is he who reads the words of this prophecy aloud and takes them to heart. Revelation 14, 13. Blessed are those who die in the Lord. Revelation 16, 15. Blessed is he who watches and is prepared for the Lord's coming. Revelation 19, 9. Blessed are those who are invited to the Lamb's wedding supper, which is you, by the way, just so you know. And Revelation 26. Blessed are those who take part in the final resurrection. I believe you and I will. Revelation 22, 7, blessed are those who obey the words in this book. Let's plan on doing that. And Revelation 22, 14, blessed are those whose robes are washed in the blood of the Lamb. So guess what, folks? You and I are blessed. That's a good thing. Now, who is the author of this revelation? How am I doing here? I've got about uh, six or seven more minutes here. Let's read on. John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, 
and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. All right, and then down in verse 11, it says, uh, let's see here, um, we said, write on a scroll what you've seen, and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamon, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. So the message is from God to the seven churches. He says from God, which is in the beginning, um, uh, and then he says to the seven spirits. Now, are there seven spirits? Do we take that literally? No. The seven spirits means the perfect Holy Spirit. And then from Jesus Christ, the firstborn from the dead. So this is from the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. The, 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 the idea of Trinity is definitely supported in the book of Revelation. So it's from the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Who's it written to? To the seven churches in the province of Asia. Now let's look at a map. I believe I have a map. There, there they are. Now, if you see on that map, you can see where Ephesus is. He says, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. Now, John considered himself a, a, an elder or a bishop in, in not just in Ephesus, but in Asia. And I would almost guarantee you that this represents a circuit over which John visited many times. So he'd start out in Ephesus, he'd go to Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Now think about the letters to the seven churches. How are things going in those seven churches? Are they doing like super duper awesome? Not really. In fact, which church has the biggest problems? Probably Ephesus and Laodicea. You have to understand that yeah, John's probably feeling a little bit uncomfortable right now, right? Because this is the church that he's an elder of. All right? So to John, this is very personal. I think we tend to forget that, all right? To the seven churches. Why seven? Well, because seven is the perfect number. It's the number of perfection or completion. But it also just so happens there probably he selected seven. I'm guessing there's more than seven churches in Asia. Probably there are, all right? Um, Troas, for example. Uh, so he chooses seven for the symbolic meaning. And yet these are seven churches that John was actually over. I got it. So why to the seven churches? Well, to represent that this is to all the church, right? Seven, a number of completion and perfection. So this is to the seven churches, but it's really to all the churches, right? All right, good. Reading on here, to him who loves us, verse 5 and who has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be his kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look, he's coming in the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all peoples on earth will mourn because of him, so it shall be. Amen. And Jesus says, I'm the Alpha and the Omega. I'm the Lord God who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. That's coming from Jesus. I, John, your brother and companion in suffering and kingdom and in patient endurance was that are ours in Jesus was on the island of Patmos. We've already seen the island of Patmos. All right. Uh, because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. So what, what John's doing here is he's establishing whatever you're about to go through, I can totally relate. All right. And essentially, John was being caught up in the very, very beginning of the persecution. The, the huge wave of persecution is coming on in the immediate aftermath of this book being written. But John's saying, what's about to come on you? Hey, it's already come on me. I was in captivity on the book, uh, on the island of Patmos. All right. So this is what God is saying to the churches. Why was he on Patmos? Because of the word of God. If you're in trouble, I hope it's because of the word of God. If you're persecuted, I hope it's because of the word of God. 
All right. And when was this? It was on the Lord's Day, right? Uh, continuing on here. On the Lord's Day, which is the eighth day, which would be Sunday for us, I was in the spirit and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. Now, let, let's, let's, let's stop there. Uh, just form a mental picture of Jesus. Okay, right, right now, in your mind, form a mental picture of Jesus. Okay, what do you see? A guy kind of humble and, you know, holding the little children and, you know, a, a quiet person, a person who uh, didn't break a, a bruised reed and all that kind of stuff. What is your picture of Jesus? All right. Our picture of Jesus is a very human picture, which that makes sense because you know, John chapter one, that's what he is. But if, if you picture Jesus now as he's in the holy temple, let's maybe change our picture of Jesus just a little bit. Let's read what Jesus is looking like right now. Again, it's, it's apocalyptic. Don't take it too literally. In fact, it's all symbolic. But one thing I tell you, this blows away my picture of Jesus, my normal picture of Jesus. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands that represents the churches or possibly the Holy Spirit. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace. His voice was the, like the sound of rushing waters, which you don't hear too much in Dubai, right? Well, maybe at one of those hotels. And in his right hand, he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp, double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. He placed his right hand on me, and he said, Do not be afraid. I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and now look. I'm alive forever and ever, and I hold the key to death and to Hades. Write there for what you've seen, what is now, and what will take place later. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So does that change your picture of Jesus just a little bit? It does for me. The purpose of Revelation is to reassure us that God is in control. The blazing eyes. God sees everything. Jesus knows exactly what's going on. The picture here is very similar to Revelation 7, 9 through 10 where it's the Ancient of Days. So probably what you're seeing in Revelation, I'm sorry, Daniel 7, 9 and 10, is probably Jesus. Blazing eyes, see clearly. White hair is purity. Bronze feet representing his strength. The double-edged sword representing the power of his words. John 12, 48, the very words I've spoken will judge at the last day. Jesus is authoritative, holy, majestic, omniscient, powerful. He stands among the churches. God is in control. Whatever is happening, pandemic, you know, unrest in the Middle East, whatever, God is in control. God rules the nations. What a great place to finish our first lesson. Hey, we got through chapter one. Um, we may have a couple minutes for questions. I'll let Jacob or whoever decide that. So that's it. And we'll, uh, either way, uh, go to my website, notes, PowerPoint. Uh, this thing will be posted there. All right. So let me give the control back. There you go.
Thanks for coming, everybody. I'm sorry. I was just saying thank you, John. Thank you for taking us uh, into your schedule to uh, be able to address. Interestingly, as you as you began this whole thing, I was going to wonder about uh, how, how are you going to how are you going to lay the ground, and you beautifully did that with with you know just 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 the numbers itself. I mean, you, it gives you an idea of uh, the entire symbolic approach. So thank you, thank you, John. I will look forward to. Every one of it, and I know your your sessions cannot complete everything that needs to be known. So it's also prodding on us to go and you know do our own research. Uh, but there are a lot of questions that could come up, and I'm going to open it just for a few minutes because our time right. is short. Um, so there are some questions up here. Okay, the mark of the beast. Okay, we've not reached there, so. Try and keep your questions to the questions that we have uh, no, covered. I don't mind that. I don't mind but since that, that's no. a number, let's go ahead and uh, the mark of the beast. What does that mean? Uh, basically, um, anybody who uh, you have to understand that uh, during the uh, persecutions, they were asked. Uh, Christianity was made illegal, and you could you could essentially get around being a Christian if you're willing to come forward to the magistrate in the city and offer some incense and uh and and make a a, a little do, um sacrifice to the roman god and so the mark of the beast would essentially mean those who did that uh, in the in the historical context it's definitely not um a, a microchip that they put in the um uh <laughs> coronavirus <laughs> Vaccination, that's for sure. So the mark of the beast essentially was accepting the domin political dominance of Rome. The number 666, of course, because six represents Satan, it represents evil, but it also represents the power of Rome. So obviously there's nothing literal here. Uh, and, you know, it, it could have, you could extend it to have a, a broader meaning than the literal context. Because nobody in our world bows down to the Roman power, obviously. Uh, we don't offer incense and sacrifice to the, to the god Roma. But in the context, that's how the people reading the book of Revelation would interpret it. Would have interpreted it as submitting to the power, the political power of Rome, and specifically making sacrifice to the Roman god. So is there anything to do with Antichrist? No. Is, is that also symbolic? First of all, I mean, people, premillennials make this whole thing about the Antichrist with Revelation, right? Guess how many times the Antichrist shows up in the book of Revelation? No. Not at all. Check it out. There is no Antichrist even mentioned in the book of Revelation. See, even we who don't pay that much attention to premillennialism, even we have been somehow bamboozled into believing the, the Antichrist is a character in the book of Revelation. But the Antichrist, the, the, the mark of the beast has nothing to do with the Antichrist. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. The Antichrist is mentioned in John chapter 2. And it's anyone who does not accept that Jesus is the Christ. And then, of course, in 1 Thessalonians 5. All right, so the Antichrist plays no role whatsoever in the book of Revelation that I can see. So all that stuff in the movies and in the books and the radio, that's just a bunch of nonsense. <laughs> the, the, the mark of the beast has nothing to do with the Antichrist. Now, you could argue if you wanted to that the beast in, in Revelation is somehow related spiritually to Antichrist. If you want to make that connection for yourself, go ahead. But don't tell me that that's, that, that that's you know, being stated in Revelation. Okay? No, I like these questions, even though it's not what I talked about, because... You might as well bring them up earlier instead of later. Amen. It says in Revelation 7, it says there are 12 tribes of Christian Jewish. 
They are the angels, agents who will share the gospel during Antichrist. Again, that if we don't take it literal, then are Jehovah Witnesses right in their claim that they are the voice, or are the Seven Day Adventists the ones who claim, you know, the 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 uh, being the messengers? Are they the yeah, angels, yeah. agents to share the gospel? Uh, yeah, the, the, the Seven Day Adventists, which goes back to the Millerite movement in the 1840s, uh, they incorrectly in, interpreted Daniel chapter 7, uh, the, the, the 2300 evenings and mornings and all that kind of stuff. And so they said that Jesus would come back in 1843. Well, that didn't happen. So, well, he came back secretly, the, the investigative judgment. And so he's already kind of come back into the, you know, whatever. I, uh, let's let Revelation 7 interpret itself. In fact, all right, this one I didn't want to do, but I, I'll just do it super, super, super quickly, all right? But then I'm kind of messing myself up because I wanted you to learn it then. But anyway, all right, we got this 144,000, right? And then you go to Revelation 7, verse 9, and it tells us who the 144,000 are in the very next verse. You would think people would read the Bible instead of listen to the radio. You know what I'm saying? Verse 9, it says, After this I looked, and therefore before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, language, standing before the throne of the Lamb, wearing white robes. So who are the 144,000? They are a great multitude that no one can count from every nation, tribe, people, language, and they are wearing the white robes, the robes washed in the blood of the land. That's who they are. End of story. Amen. You know, when, when we read uh, the Bible, of course, a lot of it is relevant and applicable to today. Yeah. Uh, the question is, you know, when it's symbolic, how much does that help in our daily Christian life? except for the fact that God is in control. Well, you know what? Really, in the end, the message of Revelation is very, very simple. You know, people get all caught up in, in the, you know, like I said, please see the forest, not the trees. The message of Revelation is God wins. We win. And that's about it. You know? And I think that's quite relevant to know that God's in control. So again, like I said, in approaching apocalyptic literature in general, and especially the book of Revelation, understand the historical setting and get the big picture, and then apply it to us. Got it? I think the book of Ephesians has a lot more practical applications than the book of Revelation. All right, and so one of the main reasons to study at Revelation is to kind of undo all these crazy, weird interpretations. That's that's not my main purpose. All right, and so if you want something complicated, read the Book of Romans. If you want something simple, read the Book of Revelation. All right, and so but on the other hand, the bottom line is the entire world is going through a crisis right now. Yes. If there's a time in my life where I think the book of Revelation is particularly important and helpful, it's right now. So how do we handle our current situation? Well, I'd say the book of Revelation is a great place to go. But get the big picture. Like I said, just read Revelation 4, read Revelation 5, and just look at the picture. That's what, that's what to do with Revelation. Look at at the picture okay so yeah. no it's not a book of lots of practicals it's not i mean if you want a book of, i mean you got revelation two and three all right there's some definite practicals there you know we got two chapters worth of it that's good but that's not the main thing revelation is about there's a confusion on the author uh some people believe that this is the brother of jesus john the brother of jesus or is it James's brother, John, uh, son of Zebedee? All right. Uh, first of all, I, the, you mean the cousin of Jesus. John the Baptist, I believe, was Jesus' cousin, not his brother. 
All right. But okay. John the Baptist was killed, but he was so it's there. not him. Uh, uh, another possibility is is John, uh, you know, bro, you know, son of Zebedee, the apostle, which is what I believe the author is. There's another guy, um, Papias. I, I I skip this little section here. Papias, who's a, a early second century writer, mentions another person named John, the Elder John, Presbyter John, and some people have proposed that the writer of Book of Revelation is not John the Apostle, but this other John, the Presbyter or Elder John. Uh, and Papias seems to support that idea. Anyway, uh, look in the notes. I, it doesn't matter. It really does not matter whether it's the Apostle John or this other John, but I'm convinced that it is, in fact, the Apostle John. I, I think, you know, people, you know, people like to have all these theories when the obvious is usually true. Uh, I wouldn't, you know, bet my salvation on it, but I, I believe it is the obvious person which the, the vast majority of the early church who would know better than us, right? How are we supposed to know? I mean, but the people uh, like Irenaeus, who knew Polycarp, who actually met John. Irenaeus, who knew Polycarp, who met John, said John the Apostle wrote this book. Besides, we know that the Apostle John was, in fact, an, a bishop, uh, a, a, an elder in Ephesus. And the author seems to be an elder from Ephesus. So uh, anyway, it's probably that guy. Yeah, as you said, it's irrelevant because they're still messengers, but uh, yeah. amen. It's and a uh, lot of the questions. Yeah. A lot of the questions are directed towards, uh, is that another time of persecution coming? Is that a vision? Is that symbolic? So I think we look forward to uh, things unfolding in the next few sessions when what is well, the mark yeah when we get to John chapter when we get to Revelation 20 there's one very very short section in Revelation 20 which might possibly hint at end time situation so through the first 19 and a half chapters this involves nothing to do with us everything to do with the first and second century got it and then, of course, Revelation 21 and 22 lies in the future. There's this little tiny section, just a couple of verses in Revelation 20, which might possibly hint at things that are going on at end times. All right? And so, therefore, how much information does God give us about that? Practically nothing. So getting caught up in worrying about this stuff is just a really, really bad idea. All right, um, so let's take the message of Revelation to be what it is, which is God is in control. And getting all kinds of stuff, worrying about, you know, is this replying to what's going on now? It, history tells us that's foolish. The Bible tells us that's foolish. Now, I don't want to call anybody foolish for asking the question. You can always ask the question. That's okay. It's okay <laughs> to ask the question, all right? But understand that uh, getting caught up in this stuff is a mistake. One final question, you know, in these uh, pandemic times, people are under lockdown, they're quarantined, and the, the internet, the wide world web is right there. With so many teachings that are coming in, and a lot of it is quoting the Bible, the end times are here, the mark of the beast is this. How does one, especially as a teacher, how do you discern the right from wrong? What would you, what would you recommend to an average disciple like us to, 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 to discern right from wrong. Of course, going say, back to the Bible, but the Bible is so symbolic that yeah. sometimes you've got to go back to the other stuff. I would say, take this class. And listen. All right? <laughs> because it speaks for itself. Remember, remember you said, well, what about, what are the, what, what are the 12 tribes? <laughs> Just... Read Revelation chapter 7. It explains it. So I'd say if we stick to the Bible and don't listen to all this nonsense, you're probably in, in good shape. I mean, why would you spend a lot of time in websites talking about the beast and, and all this sort of stuff? I mean, seriously, don't you have something better to do with your time? So I would say I would just stay away from that stuff. 
it's it's like almost like pornography or something like that. It's like spiritual pornography. I mean, why why are we even going to those websites? Let's just stick to the Bible. Or if not, if you want something a bit more than the Bible, let's read uh, maybe um, Gordon Ferguson's book or uh, the book I mentioned by Jim McWiggin or or you know solid scholarship rather than all this stuff. All right. Um, yeah. So I think um, hopefully this doesn't come across as a prideful thing, but I think taking this class is probably a good idea towards resolving some of these questions. Yeah. Amen. And with that, we look forward to the remaining sessions. Thank you so much, John, for making your time. Sure.